Contrairement à ce qu'on croit, la gauche a été au pouvoir, ce qui était peut-être un phénomène nouveau. Ils ont fait des choses. Il y a, on peut dire que, et c'est le cas pour la France, c'est le cas pour l'Angleterre, c'est le cas pour l'Italie, c'est le cas pour l'Espagne, les, les pays ont changé. Ils ont fait plus pour changer le tic, je dirais, ils ont fait plus de réformes sociétales que de réformes sociales, c'est ça le problème. Parce que ces réformes sociétales, elles plaisaient à tout le monde, les classes moyennes et les classes populaires, mais peut-être encore plus aux classes moyennes. Donc, ils ont, de ce point de vue-là, ils ont laissé de, de l'insatisfaction. Democracy is nothing else as uh, the principle of equality in action, in political action. And a large part of the Western world, uh, but I would say a minor part of the world only, is ruled by the representative system uh, since a long time ago. But at a time where many other countries are still have the desire to have access to that system. But in this Western, generally speaking, countries accustomed to the parliamentary democracy, there is a feeling of something like uh, Pierre Zavallon called uncompleted, a sentiment d'inachievement. And this feeling is not a new one. In 1789, when the constituent uh, came to power, which, uh, you know, the, the people had been chosen by the Etat Généraux and transferred them in a new Assemblée Nationale, the first obsession of the deputy was to, to try to stop the energy of the people who came first to make proposals, because they said, we are the people who have the sovereignty, and to, to ask them uh, to change uh, their decision Uh, to, to, to explain why they have decided that. And uh, this obsession was uh, important for the left and to the right. How can we stop this sort of uh, exuberance de la démocratie? The new way of uh, descent toward representative system is not the eruption, the shooting is the abstention. This is certainly a very a more and more important phenomenon that the people now prefer not to vote. Why? The professionalization of politics is a question for the world. In the United States, for instance, apparently most of the politicians are professional and everybody considers that is, uh, it's natural. But it's not natural. If politics is a profession, is to become, to mandate a profession, why to vote? We have to give a good training in a good school like the École Nationale d'Administration, l'ENA, and to choose the best. If we have to vote, is that a mandate is something else that requires not only knowledge, capacity, but legitimacy. So how to succeed, not only to respect the idea that everybody can vote, but that everybody can be elected. After the Second World War, the left in France and in most West European countries has been paralyzed by the division or in two blocs. A part, the, the Communist Party, which was uh, quite strong in France, was remained close to the, the Soviet group, and non-communists, the socialists, became only a sort of uh, minority condemned or to be completely paralyzed or, or to, to make a coalition and to get some power with the right. And at that time, this division was perhaps uh, 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 difficult for the, uh, the political climate of, of the left, but not really for the working class which had to be officially uh, represented by the left. 
because the great enterprise, the capitalist, they had some fear of the division. They had no the fear to be invaded by the Russian soldiers, you know, but they were anxious about the influence of the communist bloc on the French popular classes. And the popular classes themselves, I'm not sure, they were, they had the desire to have in France the same kind of, of regime. They did not know really, but they were not. But what was inter interesting for them is that the fear the French capitalism had from the, the Soviet Union was positive for them. Therefore, uh, the, 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 the great enterprise accepted to give a large part of their income uh, to the state to serve as a, a social, uh, as an état providence, you know, mm -hmm. and also perhaps to give from time to time better salaries. In 68, it appears a sort of uh, division between two claims, a social claim among the working class people who wanted better salaries, and an individualistic claim about new class moyenne et intellectuels, intellectuals and students who wanted to change their life, who wanted more sort of uh, uh, individual achievement. But if we look at the population of 68, there is a, certainly, it's clear, generational dimension of the phenomenon. These individuals did not want individuality for themselves, but for everybody. It was, in fact, a very democratic. In, in the United States, they wanted the people park, you know. To, it was a bit naive, but it had nothing to do with a sort of individualistic repliement or escape, you know. And if we follow uh, this generation, they have, after that, constantly, most of them voted for the left. And the period after 68, uh, the last quarter of the 19th century and, and just the beginning of 21, has been, I will say, not the golden age of the left, but the only period where the left came to power. They had the power, but what have they done with the power? That's a question. And this is certainly something to meditate, particularly for the French socialists, for the French left, but for the other, they were much more successful in societal reforms than in social reforms. They have changed the way of life by, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the mariage pour tous in France, or uh, the, the Spain was very active, progressive in that way than the other. And this was accepted because in all the parts of the society, in, certainly in lower classes, as in the middle class, uh, they, they wanted to, to, to live in, in other context, something more, more relaxed, less controlled, and, uh, uh, and, and certainly they have helped also uh, by the scholarization, particularly, I have not the time to pay attention to her, uh, created a sort of uh, uh, emancipation of the lower classes. I think, for instance, this is important to France, but also to other West European countries. The question of migration played an important role. And much before the terrorist dimension, the dimension, the terrorist dimension is another question, is that the socialists uh, were anxious not to affray their traditional population, that means the part of the middle class, also intellectuals, by giving too much to the new lower classes, because the new lower classes, they were uh, generally children of immigrants. And to speak more clearly, they were Maghrebian. And this Maghrebian who began to vote because they, they became uh, French citizens, you know, they are now in France more than three million French Muslim citizens. They began to, to vote to the left, not because, because naturally they were oriented to the left, not also because they wanted really to accept the immigrants, you know, it is a, always the same syndrome. The last who arrived, they want to shoot the door for the next, you know. But because they want to be recognized, and they were not recognized by the right. So they vote to the left, for instance. Uh, it was clear at the, when uh, Ségolène Royal was candidate to the presidential. She got the votes of the Maghrebian suburbs. 
it could be a good idea to look back to the strategy of the Communist Party in France in the 30s, in the 1930s, uh, where they were a quite small, weak party, and they decided to go to the suburbs just close to the city, La Zone, where the people were living in slums. They were very poor people, did not really belong to any municip municipality, who had no commodities and so on, who were unknown, unaccepted. They came back, they brought the uh, water installation and so on, and they got the votes of this population, and they, they kept this vote until the 1980s. This could be really a way to the left, first to accept that uh, the society has changed, it's clear, there is new classes, but the working class has not disappeared. And even in industry, if you look at the statistic, uh, there are still a larger and important part of the population. The new thing is that this working class now is largely new French people, uh, immigrants. And if you don't try to make this effort, certainly you will have few chances to come back to power. The first point that brings me to think this is that it's fairly clear if we look at the experience, at least since 1989, but even before, that the ability of parties of the left to keep together two main constituencies, that is the less skilled, the less uh, privileged, to use this euphemism, the poorer, what today can still be defined as working class, but certainly workers, and large chunk of urban educated middle class is an exercise in acrobatics that very rarely succeeds. Those parties that move more towards one side of these two uh, key sections for any leftist uh, voting majority tend to lose the other side and in the recessions the loss has been catastrophic on the side of the more of the popular vote. But I think it points to a structural problem of leftist uh, parties and leftist proposals. Second, I like very much at one point made by Andre in a book on the market. That is, the market as the sort of horizon within which people, we, expect to realize desires. Not simply to buy things, but to see the materialization of our desires. The freedom of choice that used to be a slogan of neoliberals, uh, I'm afraid has in fact uh, become the cultural matrix, certainly for the younger generations, um, who see in it one pillar of their own personal freedom, and perhaps even more so as other elements of freedom, for instance in relations to employment, to possibility to organize and plan one's own life, are further and further circumscribed and restricted, and so the value given to the freedom as a consumer is in a way paradoxically enhanced. Uh, and this is a key problem because the left doesn't know how to deal with this. It can embrace it, uh, acritically, uh, but you know, the left's raison d'etre was to tame, circumscribe, at the very least regulate market forces. Is this still a popular agenda? This I don't know. I frankly don't know. Taming market forces, circumscribing, containing, restricting market forces and I'm not talking about Goldman Sachs, I'm talking the way in which the market operates in everyday economy for each one of us as consumers as well as workers, is no longer an obvious point that the left can make uh, as a winning one. Capital, the power of global capital has become such that it is not only difficult, but to a certain extent almost impossible to push back. This is, I think, the most perverse effect of globalization. In practical terms, capital is less and less taxable. The public policies of the left of notions of redistributions, equality-oriented policies become practically terribly difficult, especially for countries that have high level of debts and therefore are exposed to financial markets, etc., etc. In the book, Andre proposes the new, larger institutional space, Europe, rather than the traditional nation state, uh, as the locus where progressive democracy could, should be embodied. Uh, I fully agree. It seems to me a totally rational and logical response to the dilemmas we are in. And at the same time, we see Europe that is you know, divided in many, many ways, I would say fragmented, even more than divided, 
in terms of economic policy between austerity or refrationary ideas, in terms of concept of democracy, more or less authoritarian, centralized, liberal, non-liberal, in terms of memory battles, you know, the various divides within Europe that we know, on top of the fact that the EU as it is now has enshrined market liberalism in its own treaties and laws. It's no longer a matter of politics. I mean, politics would have to be subversive of the law in order to uh, really contain or restrict the liberalism that is embedded in its street. So Europe is the only space that we can imagine, but it's also a highly problematic space. And this adds to the difficulties of uh, uh, leftist ascent. My feeling, because it's perhaps not much more than that, it's certainly not a deep analysis, you know, that the left, the 20th century left is actually disappearing, uh, and the, the, the leftist values and causes would have to be reinvented and embodied in an entirely different political practice. Um, it's that it seems to me the left used to be about several things, but just to sum up, three things. One was democracy's expansion, uh, expanding the perimeters of democracy, including in democracy new social group, etc. Et the second was progress. And the third was the use of the state as the tool for social transformation, social and economic transformation. And it is key that all these three pillars have become incredibly problematic. The state, obviously, is suffocated by market logic, much more than able to operate on its own to uh, contain the market logic. It's become a kind of security mechanism to protect markets. In every other space, it's very controversial. It's very contested and it's certainly not majority voting grabbing slogan, more state. Progress. I find it disturbing, interesting, revealing how there is no even a sort of semantic divide here that probably goes by generations. I mean, progress is a word that I don't think anybody under 50s understand, uh, and it's been totally replaced by this notion of innovation. And innovation is a sort of demeaning notion vis-a-vis -vis progress because it doesn't entail any social dimension. It is so embodied in technological or uh, methodological uh, issues that seems to me empower um, corporations far more than anybody else uh, in, in society. Although we have had many shifts, that these shifts still encompass this question of what is sovereignty which was the question of the, 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 the passage from the Ancien Regime to, to, to modernity. And I, I usually summarize it saying that the question was, is sovereignty, a little bit borrowing from physics, mm -hmm. a particle or a wave? Mm -hmm. It's interesting that when you spoke about the, 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 the deputies in the Assemblée Nationale uh, uh, immediately trying to limit the energy of the people, you use that word, the energy of, of the people. So it, it uh, brought me back to this physics question where they say some physicists will say energy is a particle, mm -hmm. some physicists will say energy is a wave, mm -hmm. and it's a little bit the same question that we have about sovereignty. Mm -hmm. If sovereignty is a particle, then this particle resides somewhere, and it resides in the king, and then if you shift it to la nation, it may reside on the state, but it is a particle. The state is sovereign because they have the sovereignty particle. Mm -hmm. If sovereignty is a wave, it emerges from a different, emanates, so to say, from human dignity and human rights and citizenship, and then it flows in a different way, which is more uncontrollable. And it gets bundled, not only in the state, but it gets bundled in human associations, the trade unions, the parties. I have to confess here that I come uh, uh, very much influenced by the tradition of the, of the anarchist left, mm -hmm. And I think that it, this is not the only reason why I bring uh, the perspective of the anarchist left uh, uh, to the discussion. It's, I think it's helpful to look at the anarchist left precisely because they are so strange in the left. They are not of the state as a tool because they wanted to do away with the state. Uh, they were suspicious of parties for a long time, some still are. Why are they suspicious of the state and the party, but we can still say that they are of the left? precisely because they believe that sovereignty is a wave. Mm -hmm. So it emanates out of citizenship. Mm -hmm. 
And the difference is that they want to bundle sovereignty in different ways. So Proudhon was saying, let's make federations of trade unions, federations of producers, of consumers, of farmers. And if you bundle this sovereignty of the little people, then when it is bundled, it will be as powerful as the power of the big people. Why I think it's still interesting to look, although anarchism today almost does not exist in the left, but it is still interesting to use it as a kind of a, a litmus test for what the left is about. If you think that sovereignty is a, a wave or a particle, then the question after seven, uh, 1789 and after uh, also uh, the... the the, the Philadelphia Constitution in the United States is no longer the king and the people, but it is either you build a nation and the particle is in the nation, or you build a republic and sovereignty is not a particle because it is in the citizens and the, 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 uh, uh, the republic is built from this wave of energy that comes from the people. So, of course, you can still have the... the, the the, the hybrid here is civic nationalism, yeah. but if you have a definition like Renan, that the nation is the ple plebiscite of every day, mm -hmm. what he is really saying is that sovereignty is a wave it comes from the citizen, mm -hmm. from uh, bottom up. Mm -hmm. And so every day you have to renew the pact and every, way you, every day you are voting in this plebiscite, you are voting in different ways, but you are building a republic. And what Marx is saying is that the specter is haunting Europe. He's not saying Prussia, he's not saying France, he's saying the specter is haunting Europe. So already the socialist left arises from the realization that there are common challenges to Europe, which at the time was industrialization uh, mainly, and that the, the role of the left had to be a pan-European role for a pan-European problem. So for me it appears quite obvious as uh, for you in your book, but maybe I'm uh, being a bit, a little bit caricatural here, mm -hmm. that the left must do what it used to be, which is to create objects of political desire, like, like also Federico was saying, that would be the eight hours work day or the 35 uh, hours work week or universal health care or votes for women or the end of exploitative forms of work. But in order for the left to have those kinds of, of, of new objects of political desire, it has to have clear strategies of how to attain them. And all these strategies are now in, at the European and global level. And the difficulty is that people do not believe in these strategies now. You talk about why you still think of yourself as a person of the left. Reminds me uh, the interview Eric Hobsbawm, a famous interview, Hobsbawm, uh, gave to Michael Ignatieff in the 90s when he was asked why in 1956 he stayed, he remained in the Communist Party and he said, you know, I don't want it to belong to those who abandon, you know, and you also use this, I don't even want to abandon, you know, so this, this need to, to adhere to, it's a sense of fidelity and I would like also to connect this idea of fidelity and not abandoning something that we were faithful to for many, many years with uh, what Federico said about that the, the left is over, nothing you know, is valid, we have to start you know, from sort of tabula rasa. And these are, I think, two contradictions, because on the one hand we have this need to start from the scratch, and on the other hand, we have this adherence to a sort of identity we cannot really just reject. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I think, only experience and generation. It's, it's a, you know, the idea that political identity is a historical matter. We cannot do otherwise than looking backwards, you know. And when there is a debate on the left. It's not only about how to explain the decline, but how to deal with it psychologically, I mean, really psychologically, there is this debate in Freudian terms, you know, the Trauerarbeit, the, the, the work of mourning, the Travail de Day. What would be your work of mourning, the Travail de Day, uh, you know, personally, and how to avoid the melancholy that is so dangerous uh, for the left? So that's the, that's the only question, because I was struck, struck by this contradiction. I mean, we have to stick to, your, to our jeunesse, 
but we have to start from the from the you know, from the very new. You know, the past is just the past. The other question, the question of the part of the anarchy, uh, I agree completely with you. Uh, in in my book, I refer to the French uh, mm. or to the main European Union, but so I perhaps I spoke too much to socialists because in fact even for France, uh, the uh, the anarchist movement has been. Uh, during a long time until First World War, very important. P perhaps at a time more important than the socialists. Mm -hmm. uh, those who have created the great trade union, la CGT, were uh, anarchists. They were not socialists. All the last uh, demonstrations, this new movement of uh, qu'on appelle des casseurs, bon, they, ce sont des casseurs, pas uniquement, not only, they have the same idea that they consider them as an anarchist. What it means? is now that they know that there is not another society that is possible. They don't want to, to, to destroy this society, to replace, to have another one. But they believe that the struggle of the les exploités with the capitalists would never end. And the only way to work with them is to, to be completely radically hostile to the system. This is a question in, even among more important forces. You know, it is one of the debates between the CGT in France and the other trade unions, like le, la CFDT. The CGT is not anarchist, but at the time, their strategy is very close to anarchy. That they say, we don't have to begin to, to discuss, to have discussion, because the negotiation will try to be the end of the conflict, and this conflict will never end, because the the, the relation, uh, social relations are always relation force. Mm. You know, and I think, in a way, when you uh, hear the, dis the 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 discourse among uh, Martinez, the new Secretary General of the and others, there is something <laughs> it's very strange that remains to uh, the old anarchist tradition. You know, uh, which has to be considered as a part of the patrimony, <laughs> perhaps difficult to, to, to manage, because, for instance, the Ecole des Hautes Études, where I was uh, during the time, like Laura, is now occupied by students who most of them are in, inspired by, by a sort of uh, this anarchist uh, tradition, you know. <laughs> bon, c'est comme ça. <laughs> Il peut y avoir, l'Europe a en main une tradition, ce, ce modèle que je dirais social-démocrate, qui a été plus appliqué dans des pays comme euh, les pays nordiques, l'Angleterre, l'Allemagne que la France, mais qui a été aussi appliqué en partie en Espagne, qui a eu une, un moment en Italie. Ce modèle, il est propre à l'Europe, ça n'a rien à voir avec le système américain. Et ma déception, c'est de voir que les nouveaux arrivants de l'Europe, les Hongrois, les Polonais, regardent vers le modèle américain, comme si c'était la même chose. Et ce n'est pas la même chose. Ce n'est pas la même chose. Il y a pas, on n'est pas ennemi des Américains. Mais le libéralisme américain n'a jamais été le, la, la culture de l'Europe. Et d'ailleurs, peut-être qu'un jour, il rentrera en crise aussi pour les Américains. C'était, On dit on ne veut pas d'État, on ne veut pas d'État. Et puis on s'aperçoit que la, la dérégulation, euh, ça, ça devient catastrophique. Voilà. Donc... À mon avis, s'il y a un espoir, il y a toujours un espoir. Euh, il est du côté de l'Europe.